Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design. My name is Courtney Stell, and I'm the gallery director here at REMCAD. For those of you that don't know, REMCAD is a private college founded in 1963 that offers bachelor's degrees in fine arts in seven different fields and MAs in two different fields. Tonight's lecture is part of REMCAD's VASD program, or Visiting Artist, Scholar, and Designer program. The program is an interdisciplinary initiative that fosters vision, creativity, and innovation by bringing leading artists, scholars, and designers to campus. Providing direct access to contemporary culture, the program creates a cross-disciplinary environment made possible through appreciation and critical inquiry. It's my pleasure to introduce to you tonight the VASD program coordinator, Gretchen Marie Schaefer, who will introduce tonight's distinguished guest and 18th lecturer for the VASD program. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight for the second installment of our lecture series, Interventions. This series investigates the various ways interventions function in art and design discourse today, offering moments for reflection and opportunities for change. Art and design, excuse me, art and design as cultural activities often have political effects. Arguably, every artwork or piece of design asserts a political framework. As such, this field has a unique ability to question, challenge, affirm, or support the ways in which we live in the world. These concepts bring us to tonight's distinguished guest, Micah White, a scholar and activist based in rural Oregon. White's notable biography reveals his life as an activist with national recognition as early as high school and continuing to his time in college at Swarthmore University, where he sparked the nationwide Diebold Electronic Civil Disobedience Action. White received his PhD from the European Graduate School and is a former editor of the groundbreaking Adbusters. And perhaps most infamously, White is the co-creator of the international meme Occupy Wall Street. Tonight, White's lecture, The Future of Protest, will critically evaluate past activist events and explore artists and designers' innovative position in today's digital environment of civic engagement. White contends that in the era of the internet, artists and designers possess the ability to develop socio-political interventions on two significant and very different timescales. And now I would like you all to join me in welcoming Michael White. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you very much to Courtney Stell, Gretchen Schaefer, and the Visiting Artist, Scholar, and Designer Program at REMCAD. Um, I was invited to give this talk actually nine months ago, so I've been waiting in very intense excitement and anticipation to be here today to talk to you, talk to you all. Today I want to talk about the future of political protest and some of the ways that our paradigms of social change are evolving and what we've learned basically from the experience of Occupy Wall Street. One of the remarkable things about Occupy Wall Street was its speed. I think everyone can remember how one minute there was just life as it was, and the next minute there was a thousand encampments in you know, cities across the world. At the same time, we're living through a period of dramatic technological change. Um, and so I want to talk about the speed of Occupy Wall Street, but I also want to talk about the larger slowness of the um, political, political situation that we're in. So, after Occupy, my wife and I moved from Berkeley, California, to a rural town in Oregon, um, where we live now is 270. Where I live, that's not better. That's way better. <laughs> okay. Um, so, 
after Occupy, I moved from uh, Berkeley, California to a rural town in Oregon. Uh, it's called Nehalem. It actually means the place where the people live. It has 271 people, and the nearest uh, traffic light is 30 minutes north or 30 minutes south. <laughs> and from this, this rural place, I've been thinking about and rethinking about activism um, from the perspective of both the rural politics, but also kind of getting a critical detachment from what was that exciting whirlwind of activity that was Occupy Wall Street. So today I want to talk about the future of protest from two different angles. The first is the future of protest is fast. Um, as everyone, I'm sure, is familiar, this is the iconic hashtag uh, of the, the speed of Occupy Wall Street, symbolizes the speed of Occupy Wall Street. Okay, so first, the future of protest is fast. Flies see our world in slow motion, a recent scientific paper in Animal Behavior Reports. To prove what many people may have intuitively imagined, scientists in Ireland used a test called critical flicker fusion frequency to determine the time interval perception of dozens of animals. Their goal was to discover how quickly different species can react to stimuli. The idea behind the critical flicker fusion frequency test is simple. Imagine there's a strobe light that, whose pulses slowly increase until it looks like it's emitting one constant fused light. Some animals can perceive flickers of the strobe at intervals much slower than you and I. A fly, for example, can detect four flashes where a human sees only one. And other species may perceive one light when humans see four. Scientists found that smaller organisms and those with higher metabolic rates perceive temporal change on finer time scales. And they suggested that time perception is a factor in species differentiation that helps us understand predator-prey relationships. So what does that mean? Basically what they tried to argue is that by moving faster than species, than other species in the same spatial or temporal niche, it is possible for smaller and weaker species to encode information in high frequency signals that can be detected only by their intended receivers such as members of the same species, and they're not susceptible to eavesdropping by generally, generally larger predators. So you have to imagine that, that we're sitting here right now and we're perceiving time as humans in a kind of uh, continuity. It seems continuous to us. But if there were a fly flying around, he would be imagining, he would be seeing us moving in very slow motion. And at the same time, he or the fly, it would, might be able to communicate to other flies at such speed that it would be invisible and undetectable to humans. Um, a separate study looked at the reaction time of humans and found that the fastest reaction time of a typical human is one second. It will take you one second to notice a potential danger and physically react. This is a study in scientific reports. Even a chess grandmaster requires approximately 650 milliseconds just to realize her king is in checkmate, okay? So if, you move, so if something moves faster than one second, a human can't really perceive it, and it can't react to it. If something was able to run across the stage and slap me in the face and run back in under 650 milliseconds, I wouldn't even be able to really experience it. I would feel it, but I wouldn't be able to really uh, like react in time. This is, this is interesting and problematic because obviously there are things that move very, very quickly in our time right now. Um, in this article, it was called The Abrupt Rise of New Machine Ecology Beyond Human Response. Scientists expressed concern about the recent emergence of financial algorithms on, uh, operating on Wall Street that, that move in, in sub-second timescales. So the algorithms are moving in timescales that are invisible to humans. They, they point to the troubling rise of ultra-fast extreme events. So they've gone back and they went into the, the historical you know, uh, information about stock trades, and they found these events that, that spike so high or go so low in, un, in undetectable ranges that they are invisible to humans. You wouldn't be able to see them. You only can see them in retrospect. 
Um, and, they, and they saw that, the, that the, the beginning of these ultra-fast extreme events actually coincides with the origin of the economic crisis in 2008. So these ultra-fast extreme events are dramatic price fluctuations that occur far below the perception of humans in sub-second temporality. These extreme financial events are virtual and imperceptible, but their consequences are profound in the offline real world. The sudden spikes and, and decreases in price control you know, the mortgage rates and all of these other complicated financial systems that we live in. So flies, humans, and financial algorithms all have a minimum reaction time based on their metabolic rate. But so too does the social organism, the culture, the networks, and the institutions of our society. So like the humans that compose them, it takes time for large corporations and state bureaucracies to react to emerging protest movements. And this is, the, this is what we're, like, a lot of youth are starting to find is the power, is that if you can move faster than the state is able to react, then you have a certain power. So the future of activism takes place in this gap in the gap between how quickly we as humans can move and, the, and how quickly uh, large bureaucratic organizations can react. Next generation social movements exploit time differentials in perception by moving ultra fast in relation to the status quo. I call this uh, kind of temporal arbitrage. It turns the differential between time scales into an advantage and I think it's one of Activists, one of activists' greatest skills. So historically, one of the best examples, if you're interested in, in researching this further, the best example probably is 1848 and the tactic of the barricade. So in 1848, all of a sudden, this, this whole new tactic, which was the creation of barricades that allowed people to, allowed the people to basically close the urban centers of, of European cities and then conduct these like large-scale protests, that you can chart the, the spread of the uprising across Europe with the news of the barricade. So as people learned how to construct the barricade, then this movement, it spread, and it spread all across Europe, and it, and it almost actually, at the time, people thought it was gonna be a, a Europe-wide toppling of all the governments. In France, it toppled the monarchy, so it was very successful. The same, the same thing was observed in, in the 2000s when artists in San Francisco and New York City stumbled across uh, the tactic of the flash mob, right? All of a sudden they were sending out emails to their friends, meet at this spot, they appeared more suddenly than, than the police could even react and they were gone before the police even got there. And it was kind of a fun game, I don't remember, I don't know if people remember that, but it was pretty awesome. <laughs> so, um, and then with Occupy Wall Street, we basically politicized the flash mob. So instead of just coming, originally the flash mobs, they would just like, they would meet at a square and have like a pillow fight. <laughs> Instead, we, we suddenly met at the square and we had general assemblies. So, the, so Occupy Wall Street took the flash mob to the next level and encampment spread more quickly than anyone could constrain. Um, and in doing so, in elevating the flash mob to a global level, Occupy learned that the reaction time of a modern state is 28 days. So if you, if, this is one of the things I think is really an interesting observation of Occupy Wall Street is that it takes, I think it takes a, a modern state like a United States of America 28 days before the emergence of a widespread movement and before it can roll back that movement. And one of the things that's kind of um, interesting about activism is that, you know, once the people have a new tactic and it releases their democratic passion and they go into the streets, whether it's with barricades, flash mobs, or encampments, it, it takes a lot of time for the state to figure out, well, how do we react? They didn't actually know how to get rid of the encampments. If you remember, they, there was a couple failed mis like, attempts. Every time they said we were gonna get rid of the encampment, it would actually just bring more people there. And, but once Michael Bloomberg devised the tactic of how to get rid of the encampment, then they were able to replicate that everywhere. And so within you know, a week, it was, all, it was all wiped away. So future movements will be designed to emerge and withdraw in under one month so as to triumph before the status quo reacts. That's a tremendous, um, it's a tremendous difficulty, it's a tremendous restraint. If you think, of, if you think about it, if, if you, to move very quickly, you have to complete your mission as an activist within 28 days, then it limits what you can, it limits the way you think about protesting. If you only, another reason why the 28 days thing is true 
is that you, that's basically how long an, uh, a normal citizen can sustain a protest before they get tired, before they get scared, before they start to go home. And so if you wanna, if you wanna have a, an uprising very quickly, it has to be under 28 days. Okay, now I'm gonna argue the opposite. The future of protest is slow. Activists place too much emphasis on, on celebrating the memes that kick off quickly. Speed is exciting, however, the most enduring victories are those that take centuries. Occupy Wall Street was a protest meme designed to inspire immediate action. The hashtag represented Twitter. It was intentionally designed to be viral. But imagine the opposite, a seed that waits a century or more for the opportune moment. So to study the ultra-slow triumph, I have been turning to Christianity's takeover of the Roman state in the fourth century AD. I actually started as an atheist activist in high school, and so one of my, um, one of my like, changes has been to reconsider Christianity from the perspective of social activism. Um, and if you think about Christianity, it's, it's actually fascinating because Christianity went from being persecuted for 300 years Christianity was the only belief system that was outlawed under, in the Roman Empire. They, um, as I'm sure you all are familiar with, they threw, they martyred thousands of Christians in front of cheering audiences. They would feed them to lions. They would do dramatic murder scenes. It was brutal, and it was, it was exclusively targeted against Christians. Um, and yet, Christian monotheism ultimately replaced paganism as the default religion in the West. So how is this possible? How is it that an ideology sustained itself for 300 years to emerge to become the, the official religion of Rome? It was the only religion that was outlawed, and in 300 years it became the, the official religion and paganism was outlawed. And now we are all Christian, or we're all monotheists at least, usually most of us are monotheists. So how is this possible? I think we have to put aside secular social movement theory um, and to, to look at this. Those familiar theories of social change are flawed because they privilege the modern history of revolution that begins in 1789 with the French Revolution. Almost all theories of social change start in the modern era with, with an, basically an urban movement and a, a populist movement that was based on the masses. However, in the case of Christianity, public protests and mass actions did not play a decisive role. In fact, the public protests and that, and that, and that kind of mass action only, only, played a decisive, only played a role much later after, after Christianity had become more established. So instead, Christianity owes its success to a series of high-profile conversions, which is kind of interesting. So the first is the well-known conversion of St. Paul. He was an early persecutor of the church who was struck blind and had an epiphany, a vision of Jesus Christ, while on the road to Damascus. Uh, his name was Saul and he became Paul. St. Paul became Christianity's most persuasive theologian and propagandist. He established uh, churches throughout. He was the first Christian to go into the non-Jewish communities and convert them to Christianity. He, he did three treks through, the, through Turkey up to Greece, and he's one, of the, he's one of the key reasons why Christianity became established. He, has, he actually had a tactical advantage because he was a Roman citizen, so whenever he got arrested, he could just say, take me back to Rome, and, they, and that was the rule back then. They had to take him all the way back to Rome to try him. The, the colonies couldn't, couldn't, couldn't do it. Um, so that's the first conversion. The second conversion is of the Roman Empire, Emperor Constantine centuries later. So this is one of those weird moments in history. So ancient, ancient historians record that in 312 AD, Constantine and his army were marching towards a decisive battle against a rival emperor. And they saw above them, in the, in the sky, they saw above the sun, a trophy of a cross of light in the heavens bearing the inscription, conquer by this. Apparently, not only Constantine saw it, but his entire army. Constantine, sa Constantine says that he had an epiphany that, light, that night in which Jesus Christ came to him in a vision and instructed him to draw the celestial sign on the shields of his soldiers, and that that way he would conquer. An ancient historian who interviewed, interviewed Constantine writes that, at, quote, at dawn, Const Constantine arose and communicated the marvel to his friends. 
And then calling together the workers in gold and precious stones, he sat in the midst of them and described to them the figure of the sign that he had seen. This is the figure that Constantine saw. It's called the Cairo. And he adorned his soldiers in it. That day, Constantine won the Battle of Milvian Bridge. He conquered Rome, and he ushered in the Christianization of the Western world. Right? So this is, this is an, amazing, an amazing, amazing thing. So Christianity essentially became the dominant religion because one powerful person had a, a, saw a, a miracle in the sky and had a vision of Christ that night. That's kind of interesting. And, and it's strange, right? But, it's, but it's, even, it's even stranger because if we set aside theological questions of, of uh, most scholars look at, these, at the conversion from a theological perspective. Let's set those aside. Let's, let's not worry about that. But where they see only divine in, intervention, I see an ultra-slow, long-range meme warfare. I propose that Christianity succeeded in large part because the movement mastered the art of provoking visions of Jesus Christ in powerful individuals. Okay? So the fact is that Constantine and his army probably did see a cross of light in the sky. It's, it might, it's, it's easier to try to dismiss that as a collective hallucination, but actually these kind of events are known to occur. Um, one classicist writes that the famous alpinist Edward Wimper saw a similar effect on the Matterhorn, and there's been other documented instances of celestial crosses or strange celestial signs. So let's say that it did happen. Nicholson argues that Constantine converted because he was culturally predisposed to interpret the celestial event in Christian apocalyptic terms. terms. So what this means is, it's not, that the, it's not that the cross didn't appear. No, the cross did appear. What's significant is why did Constantine perceive the cross to mean that? Why didn't he think that it meant um, a different god or another religious belief? And so the argument is that basically Christianity hijacked a meme. They hijacked a visual symbol. And, and it, gets, it gets really strange because this symbol wasn't invented by Constantine. In fact, uh, this, is 500, this existed 500 years before Constantine's conversion, um, before the Battle of Milvian Bridge. We know that pagan scribes used the Cairo to star important passages in texts. And we know that alchemists used the Cairo as a shorthand for time. Uh, that's it's Greek. It's what it means in Greek. It's a reference to the word kairos, meaning opportune moment. Only later did the Cairo take on its significance as a cryptogram. And it's a, crypt, uh, a Christogram. A Christogram because the chi and the rho are the first two letters of Christ. So to a Christian, that represents uh, Christ. But to an earlier pagan scribe or an alchemist, it meant uh, time or this is an interesting passage. So Christian, lay, Christian writers laid the foundation of Constantine's conversion by integrating a rare astro astro astronomical phenomenon into their religion. They didn't necessarily know when a cross in the sky would appear, but they guaranteed how it would be understood. When Constantine saw the cross, he understood it as apocalyptic confirmation of Christianity's messianic uh, story, and, and he converted. Some people say he was predisposed because his mother was a Christian, and there was also Christians traveling with him. But at that time, Christianity was still the underdog religion. So the Cairo, I see the Cairo as the most advanced use of a symbol to create social change because it took 500 years for its effects to be felt. I think Christianity owes its success to a series of high-profile conversions, and it's interesting to think in terms of not trying to succeed in our lifetimes, but in creating ideas that will provoke similar epiphanies in powerful people who aren't even yet born. So future movements will reconceive activism in timescales of centuries and not seconds. Okay, so that's the, that's the future of protest is slow. But of course, we, both, we all know that it's neither fast nor slow, it's both fast and slow. So this diagram right here is called a world line. A world line uh, describes the, it, it shows the orbit of the Earth depicted in two spatial dimensions, X and Y, and in the time dimension. So the orbit of the Earth is almost a circle in space, but its world line is a helix in space-time. 
So what, is this, what does this mean? It means that we have to combine the temporalities of fast and slow by connecting our, our protest to a larger human story. I see that we are right there. That's where we are in history. The Earth has been orbiting around for centuries and millennium, and it's gotten to this point, and it will continue to orbit past our death. And so we have to connect ourselves to the larger trajectory of human history in order to create activism of the future. So where are we right now in the human story? Uh, we face a kind of, on the one hand, a very apocalyptic moment. I think a lot of people feel that. We are facing an ecological catastrophe uh, as the Earth slowly expires. We are facing a financial catastrophe as global capitalism shows itself to be ill-equipped to um, distributing the world's resources in a fair and just way. But we're all, and we're also facing a kind of spiritual catastrophe as the growing meaninglessness of consumer culture is pushing people away from, from um, the culture that exists. People are being alienated from the culture because of the kind of um, spiritual and cultural crisis in the West. So on the one hand, we're in a moment, in, in kind of an end times moment. And I think it's easy to get swept up in, in, in that kind of short term thinking. Um, but on the other hand, we're also a very young species with great untapped creative potential. <coughs> Human history has been going on for thousands of years. Um, and so we have to work on these two temporal registers by developing fast actions that are, that are part of a larger geohistorical and geopolitical struggle to capture the imagination of humanity. So fast and slow is combined in a simultaneous uh, moment. The kind of activism that I do is event-based. And I think that in event-based activism, it means that what you want to do is you want to trigger an event that basically peaks so high and lasts so long that the world has changed forever. One of the reasons why that works is because you can create a space for accidents to happen. Um, with Occupy Wall Street, just by having that encampment on, in that place, it created a, a mistake. The mistake was the mass arrest of the protesters on the Brooklyn Bridge all of a sudden the whole world saw this movement and they became involved in it, right? Um, so what does this all mean for the future of Occupy? Occupy Wall Street was a constructive failure. It's a constructive failure because it shows us that our theories of social change need revision. Okay, um, there, the problem with event-based activism, or one of the things you have to be aware of with event-based activism, is that events have echoes. So really dramatic events in human history continue to replay themselves in kind of a hollow and echoing fashion outward. And so successful social movements of the past have created echoes that can continue to persist to this day. The most, and a really easy example to look at is the 2003 anti-war protests that in many ways repeated the kind of um, techniques of the Vietnam era. Right? We tried to create a mass movement with marches because that seemed to be what they did last time. And so with Occupy Wall Street, it was different. I think that with Occupy Wall Street, we were working under the impression, um, also, you know, also from the 70s, but basically a, a, an impression that I think a lot of people still hold today, which is that you can gain political sovereignty as a mass movement by creating a, a social protest that attracts a tremendous amount of people who speak in a unified voice, who act nonviolently, who um, and who and who cut across demographics, and so that's exactly what we did with Occupy Wall Street. But that, but it, but it was mistaken. It was a constructive failure because we learned that that's not actually how social change happens. Social change doesn't actually happen through mass protests um, because when it comes down to it, you can't. You're, you don't ascend to sovereignty just because you had an assembly. This is like, it sucks because if you think about, no, it's really, it's sad because like, you, it would be great if all of us could get here and this was like a town hall and we could have a discussion and then we could all agree on the future of how we want Denver to be organized and then all of a sudden, you know, like the powers that be like hand it to us. Well, 
you know, you guys are the, you know, you, you have done it. You have, convinced, you have convinced us that you are the, the people. And that's kind of like what was working with Occupy Wall Street, right? We had these assemblies where we were passing resolutions about things because all of a sudden we like got confused where, who has the power? We thought we had the power. Um, and so I think it's incorrect. I think that if you want to gain sovereignty, there's only one way to do it, and that's to win elections. Okay, so. I'm gonna now talk publicly for the first time about some of my plans for the 2014 election, and then I want to kind of open up um, to discussion. But right now, I think that the most inspiring movement in the world is the Five Star Movement in Italy. Uh, the Five Star Movement in Italy, if, are people familiar with, raise your hand if you're familiar with the Five Star Movement in Italy. Okay, good, that's good, pe good penetration. So the, the Five Star Movement in Italy um, started five years ago. They are run by an ex-comedian named Beppe Grillo. Beppe Grillo was an anti-corruption activist. He's, he, he's an ex-comedian because he moved from being a comedian to an anti-corruption activist. He was on the cover of Time Magazine in the 90s, and he started this political party five years ago on a platform, a five-star platform that's like, you know, um, free water and, and basic, basic super populist um, demands. So in five years, they've gone from zero to 25% of the vote, they are now the main opposition party in Italy, and they are very powerful. They are very powerful. And so they've succeeded in the very thing that Occupy Wall Street wanted to do, which is have political sovereignty. They have, they have some political sovereignty because they are actually in parliament. They are the opposition party. So the, the, goal, the goal is to build on, build on the successes of the Five Star Movement and and apply it to the American system. Um, one of the mistakes of Occupy Wall Street, and this is kind of what the whole global movement is realizing, is that you know the Spanish, this, so Occupy Wall Street sparked after the Spanish people held assemblies. That's where we got the idea from, the Spanish acampadas. They had all these general assemblies and that was kind of translated to the American situation. But what's interesting is that in Spain, they had these assemblies and they emerged almost immediately before the election, and the movement, the movement had a slogan called, you don't represent us, right? And so they didn't take part in the election at all, and of course, then the right won, because, <laughs> because if, the, if, the, if the left and the youth refuse to vote, then it doesn't stop the powers that be, it doesn't matter at all, then the people who did vote were the rights, and so they, they got into power. So even in Spain, you're now seeing the emergence of, a, of, a, of this model their party is called Partido X. Okay, so what are our plans? What do we do after Occupy Wall Street? My plan is to build a left-right electoral social movement that swings the America's 2014 election. To do this, I wanna work on two timescales, fast and slow. First, uh, I'm incubating a handful of emergent political parties in the United States of America along with embarking on what I call movement diplomacy abroad. I imagine a one, two, three punch that goes like this. 30 days before the November 2014 election, street protests spontaneously emerge across America and continue until the vote. Their message is simple. It is vote right in Vote for a write-in candidate. And they refer people to websites listing bottom-up write-in candidates running in local elections nationwide. There will also be new democratic parties that promote their own list of write-ins. The parties will be cool and exciting. Right now, I'm working with a bioregional party, a populist party, a secessionist party, and a black party. The goal is for one or more of these parties to win the governorship. From the governorship, I think that we can, that our movement can leverage its way to power in 2016. Part of the reason why I think that is because the governorship has a unique um, executive right of pardoning people. I think that the key thing to do right now is to capture strategic political positions that have campaign potential. You don't want, it's not that we wanna be in power in order to continue things as they are, but instead that you need that platform and that leverage position to embark on the next stage of campaigns. So we capture the governorship in order to use its powers, its powers of pardoning people, its, other, its powers of appointment. At the same time, we have to work to build 
a global movement. And the way that I think that we can do this is by importing people's parties from abroad in the hopes of winning an election in two or more sovereign nations simultaneously. So this is the, this is the, this is the, um, the trick. I think that, you, that this is the way that we stop playing by the rules, basically, is that you take a party from, that's very powerful abroad, like the Five Star Movement, that has 25% of the vote, and you try to build it in America. Because if, Italy, if the party can gain power in Italy and in America simultaneously, then it can pursue the same agenda in both countries, pushing through the same legislative reforms, and all of a sudden, that idea will capture everyone's imagination. Every single party will try to get into that game, and we will be inching toward this global political movement. So while in, while in Milan recently, I met privately with the co-founder of the Five Star Movement, um, which isn't something that I've disclosed publicly, and it was very interesting. His name is Gian Roberto Casaleggio. He is a an interesting fellow because he's actually kind of, he's Italian, but he did a lot of work in Silicon Valley. So he's kind of like a Silicon Valley meets Italy. Um, it's, and, he, and, and people critique him because they say, what's interesting about the Five Star Movement is they built themselves on, on Meetup, which is like the only successful political use of Meetup that I've ever seen. Like, <laughs> so people, <laughs> it's kind of, you know, because, I don't know if anyone's tried to use Meetup for activism, but it just never seems to work in the American context. But somehow over in Italy, it like was so wildly successful, no one understands it. <laughs> it's, just, you know, it's just how it is. And then I'm also in communication with uh, the Spain's Partido X. Um, I left Adbusters mainly to pursue this plan for the 2014 election. I think as artists and activists, our destiny is to unleash the creative potential of humanity by fighting for a global grand gesture, a grand story. And I think our rallying cry should be one world, one people. And so with that, I wanted to take your questions. Right now in the United States, um, because of the voting system that we use, there's something called the spoiler effect, where uh, the more people vote, um, uh, the more people you get to vote in a particular direction, the more, the, the more their party is split voting for two different candidates. And, uh, and so typically the result is that uh, people get the opposite of what they want. Mm. Um, how do you plan to fight against that? Well, I think the key here is that um, we have to break the alliance. Right now, there's a powerful alliance in America. It's called the duopoly. So one party's in power and one party's not in power, and they kind of rotate back and forth. The goal is to break that alliance by, by fracturing what it means to be on the left or right. And so uh, the most third parties, I think, have made a mistake in trying to be solely on the left or solely on the right. And so they do exactly what you're saying, which is that they, they split one side and they end up being a spoiler. I think that the... The, the key is to be a left-right party and to basically fracture the political consensus in America so that for one brief moment, something new can emerge. You don't need to win. The, it's kind of like a game of, um, you know, where you want to cross the finish line, and so the best way to do it is to send people from every single direction. One of the parties will get through. One of the parties will succeed. And that's why I'm, I'm a lot less interested right now in, in trying to define who it should be. One of the people that I, I'm going to work with and that I'm meeting with tomorrow is the 51st state. I don't know if you guys have been following this. this yeah. Right. So in, this, so in Colorado, you guys, I actually think that in Colorado, you guys have this, what, what might turn out to be one of the most important political um, paradigm shifts in America, which is, hey, why don't we secede? Why don't we split into smaller and smaller states? And I think that they're making a legitimate argument, which is that the, 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 urban, the urban Denver isn't respecting the rural politics of, of these northern, northern counties, which living in Oregon is absolutely, I can see that argument. You know, most activism is so centered on the urban environment and urban culture. Um, and, so that, so, and so I think that the, that the, the trick is to basically just create 
a moment of magical possibility around the 2014 election where people believe for one moment that if they write in a, the candidate that they really want to win, and that person will win and things will get better. I think that the, that the duopoly and this kind of, this kind of fear that, that will get the opposite of what we want is what keeps us paralyzed in this, in this current system. So. Mm. Micah, what, what would your goal be once you got elected to say things would get better? I suppose that's kind of uh, subjective. Yeah. What, uh, what would you say you should change? And, and uh, you have to remember that then also you're taking on the burden of running this huge conglomerate kind of, of right. employees and other things that are kind of like the bullshit part of winning. Right. No, I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think, you know, one, again, one of the nice things about living in the rural community is that it's very small, and so it's actually, like, helped think about this problem of actually city management. Um, I think, you know, during Occupy Wall Street, so one of the beautiful things about Occupy Wall Street was horizontalism, which was this kind of, this flat social structure that allowed anyone to get engaged and use their creative potential to the most. And, and, and what you saw was that things like Occupy Sandy, which was the Occupy's reaction to the, the hurricane, were better equipped and more efficient at delivering resources to the people than state bureaucracies like FEMA. This is like, articles were written about this, and it's just, it's kind of true. And so one of the things that's interesting is that horizontalism is better equipped to solving the world's problems right now than vertical social structures. I absolutely agree with you that protest needs to move beyond critique into affirmation, and that the goal isn't to just isn't just to get into power. The goal is to like is to use those positions to to bring real and concrete good to the people. And I think the, the answer is a, is a rebirth of populism in this country, where where we are, we are beholden to help and serve the people. That's our that is our duty because that is the duty that's being abandoned by the the federal government. They are they are both they they both are incapable and seem to be callous and, un and uncaring to the, to the people, to the majority of people. And so, and so it's beholden to on protesters, and I think that's, that's precisely what Occupy tried to do, and it tripped us up, because all of a sudden we wanted to feed all the homeless people, we wanted to like help everyone, and, and it, wasn't, it wasn't possible, but I think that that, imp that, that idea is correct. We, ha we are the ones who will take care of the people. And so we get into power, we provide, we, we provide the services to the people in a better way, in a more efficient way, a horizontal way than, than the current state. And at the same time, we use those political structures to dramatically change how we live. So there's like a political revolution and a social revolution. A political revolution is a change in the who's elected, but a social revolution is a change in how we live. And, and, you, and they're intertwined. You can't leave one without the other, and right now we live in a society where there's just political, not even revolutions, but maybe they are, you know, between Obama and it's a, it's, but there's no social revolution. And so the key is to do both. We both have to get into power and change the way we live. And that's through a commitment to the people, to the 99%. So this question maybe overlaps a little bit with your response here, hopefully not too much, but one of the most exciting things to me about Occupy um, was the appropriation of a non-hierarchical um, consensus building kind of model of, of, of political decision making that has its roots um, in a deep history outside of the West, but is in many ways kind of um, in uh, opposition to the way we do politics in, in Western democracy. So. Uh, my question is, how do you see that carrying through into what you're talking about of kind of trying to enter mainstream politics? Do you see that as something that kind of has to be off the table for a while and resumed later, or that can be incorporated meaningfully into the kind of things you're talking about? Hmm. No, I, I, no I, I absolutely think that we have to stick with horizontalism and leaderlessness. I think that what we need, though, is, a, is leadership. You know, We need leadership, not leaders. And so one of the things that during Occupy, people would say, well, we're not leaderless, we're leaderful. Um, we create, we're all leaders, you know? And so I, I absolutely think that, the, that, the, that there's both a tactical reason and, and an ethical reason to maintain our commitment to horizontalism and leaderlessness, both because it's a more efficient way of running the world and a more just way of the running the world, 
and it's also a more fair way of running the world. And so I think that in some of the more utopian ideas of, of the political left, like anarchism and horizontalism, were, were, in, were possibly impractical and infeasible prior to like um, some of the technological changes that we've seen. It might be that things that we previously dismissed you know, 10 and 20 years ago as being impractical, how could you possibly have a horizontalist society of 300 million people, let alone 6 billion, might suddenly be possible with these new tools of, tech, of communication that we have. And that's kind of what we saw with Occupy Wall Street. So no, I maintain this firm commitment to that. It's, it is a difficult thing, because one of the things about the Five Star Movement is, they, is they're doing kind of a blended model, right? So the Five Star Movement, actually, the copyright's owned by, the, by Beppe Grillo. And that like, makes people really upset sometimes, whereas Occupy Wall Street, no one owned the copyright at all. you know. Um, and so I think that everyone's trying to figure out this problem, but in the end, it will always involve a large part of horizontalism. That, that will always be present. Let's say we were to fracture the duopoly, and this, this was to, to work, and we ended up having, uh, we end up winning governorships, and. Uh, and have, taking more control. How do you foresee or how do you anticipate handling uh, things like the Federal Reserve and the world banking system? Let's say we did put into place a horizontal structure. Yeah. Uh, those, those groups aren't gonna step down very easily or very quickly. Yeah. Well, I mean, we were talking about this a little bit yesterday. I think that, that um, the key is to, is a kind of negotiated settlement. I think that there's like, so like, as a young activist and a lot of activists, I think that we look at the world as we want it to be. We fight the world that we imagine it is. And as I get older, I realize that you have to fight the world as it actually is. And so, like you're saying, there are these, these institutions, there are rich people. Even after the revolution, there will still be rich people. They will still have mon money and power. And so how do you deal with that? I think the key thing is that you, can't off you have to offer them a way out. You can't, create a, you can't create a scenario where suddenly the story is that they're gonna be somehow like, destroyed or like hurt or instead it's that no they will have a place but I think the argument that we're making is that they have to they have to turn over the reins of governance to others now it's time for and this is clear with the with the healthcare.gov debacle clearly whatever it is what you know the US government was not up to the task of developing a website for us to all get health insurance I'm sorry it's sad I'm very sad about it and so there is a kind of necessary realization that the people with power are gonna have to accept a kind of negotiated settlement. And so you have, and so you think about well, what would be the terms, what would get them to agree to that, and then you have a more practical like basis. But you know, like during the, during, you know what they did to Napoleon is they exiled him, you know? And I think that like there could be a scenario like that, that, that the powerful get their own country. I mean, they have one, Luxembourg, and <laughs> you know. And so, so maybe that maybe it would be like that. I don't know. I'm, what I'm saying is that the answer the answer can't be we will hurt them, we will ruin their lives, because then you're entering into an intractable civil war that will never be resolved. And the answer is instead they will have a place in the new society, but they have to understand that they they can't they no longer can provide the fulfill the promises that they made. You know the. They can't even fulfill health care. How are they going to fulfill stopping ecological catastrophe? They can't, you know, so. Kind of building off that question, you know, you have all of these people in power, kept essentially in power by this wonderful thing called Citizens United. So how do you, A, combat that money sort of barrier, mm -hmm. and you've also got people in power who can't give up their power for the sake of keeping the government open, let alone giving it to people with less power. How do you, how do you combat that? Yeah, yeah, I think that the, the key is, this is why the fast and slow is so important. So I think that right now, right now it seems impossible, and that's actually like to our advantage, because they are kind of, um, they're complacent, because it seems like well, as long as, I run the, if, as long as I raise the most money, I'll definitely win the next election. So that's actually true. 90, if you, whoever spends the most has a 90% chance of winning. This is why write-in candidacies is so important. If you don't waste any effort on ballot access, which is so restrictively difficult in America, if you don't waste any effort on petition gathering, 
any of that stuff, and instead do everything on a Hail Mary pass centered just around those 30 days, <laughs> then it's just it's an ambush. Either it succeeds wildly or it fails absolutely, but, there, but you haven't wasted any of your effort. And so I think that the key is this kind of like, is kind of basically relying on their complacency, being comfortable with the fact that for like all the way up until 30 days before the election, there will be no talk of any third parties at all until one day, hopefully, a series of occupiers all of a sudden start this beautiful eruption. And so I think that that's the key. Is I think that, the, that the, the campaigns that seem most likely to succeed are the ones that are impossible because they are, it's like they've, 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 let, they've they created a, a huge wall by keeping us out of the ballots and they don't really like, they don't, it's not like they're patrolling the wall. You know what I mean? Like they've kind of like, they're overconfident. That would be my answer. And so I, th I think that you have to kind of basically use that to your advantage. Can I ask you, do you see oh, it's a little bit funny. It's just real quick. I'll say it loud. Um, is there a leader that you see uh, that can rally the people and then accomplish goals at the same time and kind of live in that balance between like being so popular and such a loved individual and also be someone who just rallies and gets things accomplished? No, and I think we should probably resist them if they try. Um, it's a delicate balance, but I think that if the, the mistake of the 20th century was that the people invested their will into these leaders, um, and so you had across the left and the right, Hitler, you know, Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot. Um, I think that, that the lesson of the 20th century is you cannot allow yourself to give over your will to an individual, no matter how charismatic they may seem and how much you really like them and want to just like believe that everything's gonna be fine because Hitler told me so and I just have to follow him. The interesting thing about the Five Star Movement is that Beppe Grillo doesn't run for office. He was in some sort of criminal, uh, like drunk driving accident or something, so he's not eligible to run. But on top of that, he's like he refuses to kind of like engage in that thing. So I think it's precisely that we have to reject leaders and instead become leaders ourselves. There should be no single all-powerful person at the top. It is too dangerous. And honestly, they I mean, they can't do it. Imagine how could. How could one person run the entire world? It's not, you're just, you're just gonna create a horrible situation. It's so, reject them. Sorry. <laughs> so um, part of political strategy is always seeing what the other side is gonna do to stop you. Mm. And I'm sure you've thought about that, so I'm curious about your thoughts. Um, what you see as the opposition coming towards this plan? The opposition coming towards this plan. Like once you start. Yeah, um, I, it's, it's kind of strange, but like you know, sometimes the like I'm saying about fast and slow is that we actually can be kind of invisible to them. The thing about Occupy Wall Street is that if you look back on it, actually, it was it was actually largely invisible to the powers that be. They they like if you look at like the kind of memos that were sent out, they were full of factual errors. They because. Part of it is that the state can't react to every single threat. They don't, okay, the state doesn't know which event is gonna become the, none of us knows which event will become the next social movement, Occupy. And so it, it has to make a calculated risk. It can't respond to every single potential protest in the strongest possible way. It has to only respond once it's become clearly a threat. And so that's why it's, with maintaining yourself to a strict time discipline is so crucial. Because it takes them time to respond. If they went around trying to squash every single protest, they, they, they just can't, it's too exhausting. And so I, I actually rely on the fact that they are going to just dismiss the plan, think it's impossible until it succeeds. Just like Occupy Wall Street. Uh, along those same lines, um, with all the revelations about electronic surveillance going on, and in order to surprise the other side, I mean, are you gonna, communicate perhaps less electronically and more, you know, like old fashioned letter writing or something so yeah. that so that the other side can't listen in or or how 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 can you keep them from knowing that this is coming up? Right. I mean, but I, I think it's better to try to develop a thing that even if they knew they wouldn't be able to stop it. So even if they're aware of the plan and they're aware of your strategy then you, the, the nice thing about electoral politics is that it's a really murky area, and if, you, if, you, if, you, if the government acts too strongly to suppress an electoral movement, then they're actually directly 
targeting democracy itself. So there's a, it's a very complicated. It's not like a social protest where maybe there's going to be vandalism, maybe there's a security risk. If you're actually organized, uh, if there were 50 million Americans across the, across the country protesting and about voting, it's a totally different matter, and it's a very delicate situation. I think it puts them in a very delicate situation, especially when the protest is right around the election, because the protest becomes an act of electioneering, which then in itself seems to violate electoral law. So I think instead what you want to do is just basically twist them up into confusion about how to really react to something like this. Would, you, would they really try to stop protesters whose main argument is vote right in? And what would the effect of that be on their legitimacy? You know? And so I think that the, there's no need to be um, afraid to say out loud if, in fact, I think that it can almost encourage them to think that there's a conspiracy. There's no conspiracy. It's just um, you know, openly discussed. So I, I think I, I actually just operate from the perspective that we move too quickly, so we're invisible. And if we're not invisible, they dismiss you. And if they don't dismiss you, then, well, it's too complicated for them to really stop you. You know, <laughs> everything's just make it all transparent and, and enmesh them in compl complications. Okay, I think we'll do two more questions. Okay. So I saw one hand over here for a while. Micah, I was wondering what you think about the um, vote out all incumbents idea. As a meme, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I think it sounds good. I mean, one of the things the Five Star Movement did very well is they, their platform was, we won't work with, an, we won't join a coalition with any of the established parties. If we get into power, they can join our coalition, but we won't join their coalition. I think the same thing can be said. If we won't work or vote for anyone in the two parties. If those politicians want to join our movement, then they can become independents. They can start their own parties but we will not vote for neither a Democrat nor a Republican. I think that's one of the mistakes of the Tea Party. I think the Tea Party uh, jumped into bed too quickly with the, the Republican Party. And so one of, the, one of the goals of this thing would be to, to bring the Tea Party back as a, as a third party. If the Tea Party wants to be a party, be an actual party, the Tea Party, not the GOP, not the Republicans. Um, and so I do think that's a, that sounds like a very good mean. Don't vote for either party, incumbent, yeah. Which, by the way, I saw a Gallup poll, and that's most Americans are angry with who they voted for. Most Americans already agree with that. Last question. Last question. Okay. Michael, where can we reach that email? Yeah, you can go to my website and email me. Very easy. Very transparent. <laughs> <laughs> MicahMWhite.com. Uh, it sounds like breaking up the duopoly seems like a priority in this kind of action that you're doing, um, and you're going to do it with a third party that's left and right, and it's, that feels kind of problematic to me because it seems like a lot of the principles, the political principles that you are espousing, like addressing environmental catastrophe, equality in, in the economic sector, um, these kinds of ideas are distinctly left ideas. And so is it more important to break up the duopoly or to put in policymakers who stand for the kind of principles that you feel like our world needs? Okay, I, I, I believe that, um, that the right has many good ideas. So in terms of what the right can offer the left is they have established the constitutional arguments um, and for secession, for example. The, the idea of seceding is a kind of a rightist idea. In terms of, I mean, I think that you have to, we have to critically appraise what the left claims is its ideas and what are actually just the, our populist ideas. Um, populism to me is a left-right thing. In terms of the environment, a lot of the problems with the environment is that the left likes to celebrate the environment, whereas Republicans actually live and use the environment. That's something I've, lived, I've learned living in rural Oregon, is they're hunting, they're fishing, they're actually getting a lot of their calories from using the environment. And that's kind of distasteful sometimes for the urban leftists, like, no, the environment should be over there. And so for me, it, <laughs> No, I think it's, the, we, want to, we want to create a preserve, but there are people like, and I don't mean this in a derogatory sense, but throughout history there have been people who have been called the hill people. If you look throughout history, there's always been the hill people. The hill people, it's true, the hill people are the people who live in the nature, and, and the people in the city are always like, 
oh, they're so uncivilized up there in the hills. They should come down to the plains. This started in Mesopotamia and like, and so like, um, and Macedonia was very like, it was, it was a very distinct, you know, distinct cultural thing. And so for me, it's, it's about redefining populism, finding this, the, the bridge issues between left and right and building on those. No longer trying to find these leverage points. You know, it's okay to work with people who disagree with you about some things. That's, that might be absolutely necessary. The 99% is not 100% left or right. And so it's about finding these common areas. I don't think that the left has the exclusive control over the truth. Thank you, Micah. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. I just had one quick announcement. Um, our VASD program intervention series will continue in the spring. So please come back and visit us in the spring. Um, and Nader Tarani will be here January, Friday, January 25th. He is the head of the architecture department at MIT and the director of the design firm NADA. Um, so come and join us then. You can follow us on Facebook and at remcad.edu. Thank you again, everyone. Have a great night.